After the proclamation of God's word, we'll sing together from hymn 43, stanzas 1 through to 6. No, that's not correct. Hymn 58. No? Sorry. Psalm 128, 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> Get this right. <clears throat> Beloved brothers and sisters in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, it's no secret that Christianity is quite divided over something that we're going to do later in this worship service, namely baptize this wonderful newborn child, Matthew, or Theodore, sorry, Theodore Matthew. In any case, Christianity, as you know, is sadly divided over the question whether we should be baptizing those who have not professed their faith yet. Many feel that there's no biblical justification for doing so. They believe the New Testament data is simply silent about this whole matter. Well, we beg to differ. I most adamantly believe that when you line up the data from the Gospels, for example, when Jesus embraces the children, and from Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 7, where Paul actually says the children are holy, or Ephesians 6, where Paul is addressing the congregation at Ephesus, and he speaks a special word to the children, then you will see there's one line in the Old and the New Covenant, a line which sees children of believers belonging to the people of God, and called just like the adults to a life of faith and repentance. And so to Acts 2, verse 39, here we have more conclusive evidence that this is so. Children belong to the people of God, and they ought to be baptized. The Apostle Peter says in Acts 2, verse 39, our text for this morning, for the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. The truth of God's word comes to you under this theme this morning. The promise is to you and to your children. We'll talk about the nature of the promise and the recipients of the promise. The nature and the recipients of the promise. Brothers and sisters, what is it that is happening here in Acts 2 when Peter pronounces these words? Well, it's the day of Pentecost. The promised spirit has been poured out. And Peter, in a lengthy homily, is attempting to explain this event. Even though it's a long time ago, I do remember that the first time I ever had to preach on Acts 2, on Pentecost, I scratched my head and wondered why Peter seemed to be saying so very little about the Holy Spirit, and he seemed to be saying everything about Jesus Christ. And I wondered whether Peter got diverted in his sermon. But Peter did not get distracted. This was exactly Peter's point. His point is, his message from beginning to end is that Jesus Christ is the one who poured out his Holy Spirit, and he is the one who has come with visible signs of wind and tongues of fire in the Spirit. He said to us, I will be with you to the close of the age. He's with us also in his Spirit. Peter comes to the point in 2 verse 33, Jesus has been exalted to the heavens, has received the Holy Spirit, and he has poured out that which you yourselves are seeing and hearing. Peter is saying in light of that Old Testament event, and in, in that light of that event and all the gospel events, He's saying that Old Testament Judaism, Old Testament religion has found a new center, a new focus in Jesus of Nazareth and the need to approach Yahweh and see Yahweh through Jesus. But the other message, the message that would upset this largely Jewish audience on the day of Pentecost was about the tragic mistake they had made. They thought that for the sake of the future of Israel, they had to crucify, get rid of Jesus of Nazareth. But Peter's message is, this Jesus whom you crucified, he was the Messiah whom you were waiting for. God has made him both Lord and Messiah and exalted him to God's right hand. That is the person you crucified. It was a stunning message. 
But it produced a good result because notice what happened according to verse 37. Luke says the audience was cut to the heart. It means they were convicted of sin and conscience stricken. And so they ask, what shall we do now? Peter's reply is they must repent completely changing their mind about Jesus and their attitude to him, humbling themselves because of sin, and they must be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, submitting to this humiliation. And it was a humiliating message. Baptism was something the Jewish leaders would, would, would do to Gentile converts to Judaism, but they're told, you must believe and be baptized like you used to baptize the Gentiles. Baptism would serve as a clear public token of their repentance and of their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And if they would do that, Peter says, if they would believe and be baptized, they would receive two free gifts from God, the forgiveness of their sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a great message of grace. They would be forgiven even for their sin of having crucified Jesus. And they would be given the Spirit who would regenerate them, dwell in them, and transform them entirely to live new lives. It's a great message of inclusion. They should not imagine that the gift of the Spirit is only for the apostles or only for the 120 disciples who had waited 10 days for the Spirit to come or any elitist group or even for a certain nation. God places no such limitation on His offer or His gift. Nations will be called even those with heinous sins and no merit at all would be included. The promise is extended to all those who now regret the crucifixion of Jesus and repent of their sin. And notice it's also for your children. Literally, he says, for you and your offspring. Think about that. Think about that. Was that not always the way it was in the Old Testament era? When God came to people, he also embraced their offspring. When Abraham is told in Genesis about God's covenant, then he's told not only that he and Sarah and the other adults of his household are in that covenant, but also their children. Even, you should notice, his adopted children, even the children who are not his own children, but they're in his household. They are part of this covenant people. They're told very expressly to circumcise all the male children. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you every male among you shall be circumcised. Think of the Psalms that rejoice over the gift of children. Think of Psalm 74, 78, which we sung together. Think of how it will go if this was not true. Imagine if this was not true. Then before this, all these Jewish people would have regarded their children as part of the covenant and the covenant promises But if the promise on the day of Pentecost is only true for mature, repentant adults, then that would be a dramatic change. Suddenly, their children would be excluded. They would not be welcome, and church would be an adults-only kind of club. One author put it this way. He said, Let us read our New Testaments with an understanding of the original audience. If we stand in the sandals of the first century Jewish The followers of Jesus, how would they have reacted to the Baptist claim that believers' little children are excluded from the people of God? (coughs) Imagine the shock of Crispus, the synagogue leader of Acts 18, who believes on Friday, let's say, his children are in covenant with God and fully part of the people of God. But then after Paul preaches, he finds out that in the fulfillment of all the promises... In the fullness of time, in the messianic kingdom, in the glory of Israel, now his little children have no part in the kingdom of God. Wouldn't that be odd? Do you not think if such a radical change happened, there would have been someone in the New Testament church who would have asked for some clarification? What do you mean? What's this about our children? 
Or would an opponent of the apostles not have stood up and caused all kinds of havoc and ruin for the apostles? If you read Paul's writings, he's always fighting against some apostles. Under every tree, there seems to be some opponent of the apostle Paul. Surely they would make hay of this. What happened to our children, Paul? It doesn't happen because, obviously, everything remained in the new Israel on this point as it was in the old Israel. In both, children and young people are raised in the fear of the Lord and are expected to respond with faith and repentance. Isaiah 59 and more such passages say that very powerfully, much may change when the Spirit has poured out But this will not change. The New Testament age is not less. It is more in every possible way. Now you might say, well, that depends on how you read, how you understand the word promise. The promise is to you and to your children. But even Baptist authors who write about these chapters see no different meaning than we do. One such Baptist author writes, there is only one single promise that according to the New Testament writers has been unfolding as the plan of God since it was first announced in the Old Testament. He points out 40 times that 40 times when the New Testament wants to summarize the Old Testament word, the Old Testament gospel, the Old Testament message, it just uses the word promise. Another one argues for the unity of the promise in all Scripture and writes, the promise oath continues unchanged in essence throughout the history of redemption. The promise continues unchanged throughout the history of redemption. And I'm thinking, how can you be a Baptist then? In the ESV, the word promise occurs twice before this in Acts. In Acts 1 verse 4, the Lord Jesus speaks of the promise of the Father, and he refers back to what he said already earlier in the days of John the Baptist, that there would be a day when he would pour out his Spirit, baptizing not just with water, but with the Spirit of God, which is exactly what Pentecost is. And in Acts 2, verse 33, Peter talks about Christ receiving from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. So clearly the promise speaks about all the spiritual and blessed realities that God has always promised to his people. New birth, spiritual life, eternal life, blessings in this life and in the life to come. You don't experience all of this now, but you have a promise But if you have experienced this, you will receive also all these wonderful things. To whom is this promised? To those who were there on Pentecost Day and responded with guilt and awe and softness of heart to the message of Peter. To them and their children is the promise. It's the promise of new life. It's the promise of the fullness of new life as centered in Jesus Christ. It's the promise of the presence and the power of the Spirit out of which flow justification, sanctification, being a member of the new covenant community with all its benefits and eventually glorification on the new heaven and the new earth. All that is what is promised to believers and their children. But you have to realize Don't be mistaken about this. The promise is not the reality. The mere fact that our children have the promise does not necessarily mean that every child that is baptized experiences the reality of what is promised. No, children like adults need to learn to respond in faith and obedience. The truth is when there's really no big difference on this score when it comes to children or adults, the the challenge of every little child on his or her, the lap of mom or dad is to just embrace the story which they heard and to just acknowledge who God is. And it's the same challenge we have as adults, even when you become retired and of advanced age, it's the same challenge to just receive the Word of God and receive it as the Word of God. 
and to say no to all the doubts. That's the same challenge whether you're uh, four years old or whether you're 40 years old or whether you're 80 years old. Children, like adults, need to learn the re to respond in faith and obedience. Baptism is, as our confession suggests, a sign of that which is signified. And that which signified is life and salvation. But how do you get this new life and this new salvation by way of that which is the connection between the thing signified and the sign? The sign may be baptism. The sign may be Lord's Supper. But the way in which you get that which is signified is through faith. Faith is the connection. That means everybody needs to believe. Everyone needs to be born again. Jesus said this to Nicodemus, that, 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 that old man, that Jewish man. And when he said it to him, he meant it for all the Jewish people and for all adults and for everyone. You need to be born again. We're going to go to a new heaven and a new earth. Do you think you can get in there if you're not new? New in Christ? Those precious new babies will show sinful patterns and sinful attitudes. They need to be born a second time. There is no one who gets into life eternal without being born again. That's why the second sentence of the form for baptism, I, I, I believe we, we overread it, we, we, we overlook it, we, we think we know these forms and we don't need to read these forms, we overlook it. We cannot enter the kingdom of God, it says, unless we are born again. That's why the promise is not a guarantee either. Baptism is not some absolute guarantee what is it that brings about the reality? It is faith. The children of the covenant community are no different than the adults. They need to respond in faith and repentance. We need to be called again and again, even every Lord's Day, to repentance. Promises, to be sure, are valuable. You see, if I promise you or I promise members of my family wonderful things, you can expect that they will come about. You almost have it. You will get it if you believe that I'm a man who's trustworthy and going to do what he says. So when God makes promises, that's valuable. Imagine the powerful, loving God of heaven and earth making promises to you. Life blessings. He promises. But promises are not the reality. The reality comes about through faith. If I make those wonderful promises to you, you need to believe that I'm able to do the things that I promise and that I'm good enough to do them as well and strong enough. So too with God. God's promises are always conditional on faith. If you or your children are to receive life and blessings eternal, you and your children do need to believe that God can and will bring about the very things that he has promised. Faith is trusting God to do what he has promised because we are convinced of his provisions that God is both willing and able to keep his word. The problem is that our generation, and I'm afraid the Baptist world has no idea what a promise is. And our generation has no idea how powerful a promise is. Without a promise, all you have is hope. It might happen, it might not. You see, they say that there are some very wealthy men in the world today, in North America and around the world, who have decided that if they give away about half of everything that they own, they won't be any poorer. Their lives won't change. And so they've established foundations and whatever else in order, to, in order to give away half of what they own. So imagine that, 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 that one of those men would, 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 would promise you $5 million when you turn 40 years old. That would be a nice promise. And, and, and if you believe he's a trustworthy person, you can start to bank on that promise. But what do you get if you have no promise? This man is giving away his money right now. What do you get? What do you hope to get from him? Obviously, nothing, because you don't have a promise. 
Well, so too, this is your privilege. You get a promise from the God of heaven and earth. The one who made you, the one who remakes you, the one with all that power and that love, he says, I promise. Your life may be tough now. You may go through a life of suffering. You, like the whole world, may cower in the face of a single virus, but there's a better day coming. There's a greater future coming. I promise. The whole Christian life depends on the promises of God. In the words of the hymn, of by the Gettys. By faith this mountain shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall prevail for we know in Christ all things are possible for all who call upon his name. We will stand as children of the promise. We will fix our eyes on him, our soul's reward till the race is finished and the work is done. We'll walk by faith and not by sight. And because we'll walk by faith and because we are children of the promise, we believe baptism is a sign of the promise and we will baptize every one of our children, everyone in our household. But let's think a little longer about the phrase, you and these children, these recipients of the promise. <coughs> Given the larger context, I think it would make little sense to maintain that children here are not included. I mean, think of it in chapter 2, verse 17, Peter quotes from uh, Joel's words and speaks about how the, the sons and the daughters shall prophesy. We read those words. And your young men shall dream dreams. He says, this is fulfilled today on the day of Pentecost. Young people are prophesying. Your sons and daughters are prophesying. Your young men are going to dream dreams. But do you suppose that right after that he would say, but actually your sons and daughters are not included until they repent? Would that be a logical conclusion? Besides, Acts 2 verse 39 says it, children, the promise is to you and to your children. How many times does God have to say something to be, for it to be true? The, the, the Baptist claim is that we don't have explicit words. Well, isn't this explicit? The promise is to you and your children. How many times does God have to say something for it to be true? Only once, if you trust in Him. The word for children that is used in Acts 2 verse 39 does not designate the age of the child. It simply refers to the offspring of parents, their posterity, whatever their age. In discussion, some will try to reflect the attention away to what follows and, all, and to all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. At times, they speak about this in a way that suggests this means the promise is to everyone, all those who are far off, wherever they are. In effect, that makes the promise quite useless. In general, just another part of the evangelism task and you can ask them in vain, like, how does this work exactly? What's the point of the promise when all this, how does this work? But think about it. On the day of Pentecost, where is Peter? Where are these people? They are in Jerusalem. It's the disciples and the first believers who are gathered in Jerusalem. To them is the promise and to their children the question might come up, well, what about what happens when these disciples go to other areas, to other towns and cities? What's going to happen then? Is the promise valid then in some way as well? Yes, says Peter, and for all who are far off. What does that mean? Did Peter maybe have in mind we in North America who might believe 2,000 years later? I doubt it. You have to be mindful of the fact that in Acts 1 verse 8, the Lord Jesus says to the disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. How far does that go? Well, by the time we get to the last chapter of Acts, Paul is in Rome. That in Luke's mind is pretty much the end of the earth at the time, the end of the known world. So with that phrase, and all who are far off, the Holy Spirit leads Peter to be mindful of what would happen on the later missionary journeys. That's why we read together from Acts 16, where Paul and Timothy 
are in Acts 16. Where is that that they are? It's in Philippi. How far away is that? Well, to get to Philippi from Jerusalem today, you have to go north through, <coughs> through Lebanon and through Syria and across Turkey, and you have to go up to more northern Greece. It's about 9,700 kilometers, 6,000 miles between Jerusalem to Philippi. Do you think that would qualify as a place afar off? I think for Luke, it certainly would. It's close to Rome. If you would travel by bus today at an average of 50 kilometers an hour, it would take about 200 hours. On foot, as Peter, Paul probably did it, an average walking speed of more four miles an hour, it would take about 1,500 hours, 62 days if you never slept. These people in Philippi, we can all agree, are far off. Well, how does it go then with the gospel spread in Philippi? We read about this Philippian jailer and his conversion. But did you notice that in that passage, even though they all hear the word of God, the only one that Luke says believes the word of God is the jailer. But then verse 33 reads, and he was baptized at once, he and all his family. He's the only one who believes, but he and all his family are baptized. And verse 34 reads, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. The NIV is actually quite wrong when it translates this, and he and his entire household rejoiced because they all believed in God. The Greek doesn't say they all believed in God. It says he believed in God. And so to the story of Lydia, we didn't read that one, but notice what it says in Acts 16, verse 14, 15 about her. Acts 14 speaks about the Lord opening her heart, and as a result in verse 15, she and her household are baptized. These members of her household were baptized by virtue of her profession of faith and baptism. Do you really want to presume that in these households that are recorded in Acts and throughout the letters, there are no children, never any children? What kind of households are those? Those are not modern households of 1.5 children. This is ancient households with children all over the place. If you want to read more about this, pardon the advertising, but I once contributed to a book, Children in the Church, written by CRTS professors as a result of a conference, and Dr. Dan Hollander, my successor, has a wonderful chapter on the book of Acts. But the point that Acts 2 verse 39 is making is that this is the pattern. This is how it goes in the New Testament age. The promise is not only to believers and the children of believers on the day of Pentecost, so it will go too as the gospel goes out to Jews and Gentiles and the missionaries go out to the end of the earth, according to Acts. Whenever the gospel goes out to those places and a man or woman embraces the gospel, the promise is not only to that man or to that woman, but also to their children. Why? Because those people are going to be transformed by the gospel, and they will want to speak with their children about the gospel, and they will teach their children about the gospel, and God extends, therefore, his promises to them. <coughs> God has never been cheap about his grace and about his promises. This has always been God's way. God promises parents, do that as leaders in your house. Believe in me, and I and all that I have is yours, and it has always been, and it will also be your children's. You need to believe, of course. They need to believe, of course, but the promises are theirs. The promises remain theirs. That's always been God's ways. We live in an excessively individualistic age, and as we live in this individualistic age, we tend to read the Bible as individualistic people, and hence the Baptist movement. 
But the truth is the Bible is written in a time when people always thought corporately. They thought not just about themselves. They thought about their families. They thought about their people. you got to read the Bible with ancient eyes, with Jewish eyes, even with corporate eyes, seeing the body of the people of God again and again and again. All who are afar off, it applies to Asia Minor, to Rome, to Philippi, even today to Canada and around the world. It is the rule. (coughs) God embraces a person totally, and when he embraces him or her, he embraces also those who are theirs. Peter says, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself... It reiterates that message. What is this call? It is the call of the gospel. Whenever the gospel goes out, the point is, it is a real offer. We should not argue that it's only a real offer only for those who are elect, only for those who believe. No, it's a real offer. When you say to your neighbors, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, it's a real offer. You can spread the word among your neighbors and say it. God makes promises to you and to your children if you believe and turn to him. They are real promises, as real as God is. The point is, if you argue, as too many have, that the scriptures do not support infant baptism, then you really do not know the scriptures adequately. And then you shortchange your children, and you shortchange your grandchildren. You stop them from seeing God's promises to them, and you stop them from building families on the basis of the promises of God. The scriptures cry out, God promises. God doesn't lie. A promise from him is better than a promise from any single person in this world. It's a promise from the God who is ever so trustworthy. Believe in him. Of course, the point is well made. Churches that practice infant baptism still need to emphasize faith and conversion. Children are not included simply because they are part of the social ethnic club which they go along with. If we never emphasize faith and conversion, if we never speak about this, then all we become is a Dutch-Canadian ethnic club. But because we know we must believe and be changed and repent and turn, we know that we are united as the people of God, not by our Dutch roots, but by our roots in Jesus Christ our Christian roots, a common faith in him. That is what unites us with each other better than anything else. That is what unites us with people around the world, even when we don't even know them yet. It's often said, God does not have grandchildren, and that's true. You know, when you have children, then if things go as they normally go, eventually you'll have grandchildren, and you'll have more grandchildren. It it happens somewhat automatically, at least from the point of view of of a grandparent. But God doesn't automatically have grandchildren. Every successive generation does not just get this as part of their inheritance. They need to embrace this God on their own. They need to do their own profession of faith, and it needs to be meaningful. It needs to mean something. Theodore Matthew here needs to be taught about God and his son. The Bible needs to be open, an open book in his family and every family where baptism happens. And it's not just about knowledge, it's also about his heart and and the heart of every child who's baptized. He will need to believe on his own. And don't imagine that he'll only do that when he's 18 or 19 years old. Maybe he's going to do that at five years old. He will do that when his mom or dad reads Bible stories. Of course it's true. Of course this is God. You you told this to me. He'll believe it even from the teacher. The teacher said so. It must be true. He'll believe it because God says later on there may be doubts. 
that come about. Because later on, all these other questions come up, and later on, you go to high school, and you go to university, and all these other things come up. But the challenge for Theodore is the challenge for every one of us to keep believing throughout the ages, whatever we go through, whatever obstacles we come against, whatever problems we face, to keep believing and to keep repenting because God promised and God speaks the truth. God, you could say, does have promissory grandchildren. He makes a promise which can wonderfully be extended from generation to generation when every successive generation embraces him. You know, I stand 100% behind all the evangelism and missional activities that are going on today. That is as it ought to be. The church does not exist just for itself. The church also exists for the community and the world around about. It's still our task to get this message out, not just in foreign countries, but also in our own country, in our own towns, our own cities, our own neighborhoods. But while that is true, we should not overlook the fact that the greatest benefits of the spread of the gospel are found there in our own homes and our own families. Said one man, I do not hesitate to, to claim that far and away the largest part of the Christian church at any time or any place are those who were born and raised in Christian families. The biggest harvest is going to come from among those who are brought up in Christian homes and are taught God's ways to their benefit. The harvest God receives in the church throughout the generations, he was saying, far exceeds that which the harvest can possibly reach from outside. It means we should not stop overlooking the great significance of the small and ordinary things we do in our lives. Reading the Bible to our children, it's ordinary, but it's so significant. Speaking with our children about the Lord, do we ever do that enough? Admonishing our children. A father's admonition, an elder's compassion, a brother's rebuke, a grandfather's reminder, a teacher's correction the pastor's catechesis, don't underlook, uh, overlook the power of any of those. They're all based on the promises of God, and God is true. Precisely because faith is important, the church and the family of God also that nurture that faith and pray for God's blessing over all such nurture. It all means you need to have an eye for the greatness of the Father's love to you and to your children, and you need to communicate that again and again to him or to her. In the words of another hymn, we are the people of God with the freedom of hope in our hearts. How great is the love of the Father. This is the song of the redeemed, the ransomed and the free, given life at such a price, this is love. Embrace that love. Embrace God and love Him with your children. Amen.